Hi, thanks for joining us online. We're so grateful for the opportunity to connect with you. Whether you're a regular here at LBCC, a fellow follower of Jesus, or maybe you're just someone who's looking to learn more about Jesus and what Christianity is all about. As a church, our aim is simple. We want to connect you to Jesus, the God who is the source of all life and goodness. And in doing that, we want to connect you to others because community is God's idea. And, and it'll help you walk toward, toward Jesus with others. We want to also help you grow. Grow as a whole person, grow in your faith. If you're going to be a Christian, you want to have a dynamic relationship with God and join others in that journey of faith. And finally, we simply want to help you find ways to invest your life, to be part of something bigger than yourself. When you join yourself to Jesus, you're part of the biggest mission that's ever been done on the earth. And you can impact your home, your family, the people you love, the people you work with. You can impact your town and your city. Today, we hope you'll be encouraged by the sermon. But here's some information on some upcoming events first. Our Sunday service is back in person at 9.30 a.m. Masks are not required, but are encouraged for those who are unvaccinated. We also invite you to join one of our other events as an encouragement on your journey to connect, grow, and invest at LBCC. We host breakfasts for women and men on the second and fourth Saturday mornings. You can sign up at lbcovenant.org slash welcome slash upcoming dash events. Check out our life groups, a great way to meet and get to know us better. Some of them meet in person, some on Zoom. There are a couple times a month. And of course, visit our website or call the office at 732-870-2028 to get info or ask for prayer. We'd love to help you in any way we are able. Now, here's today's sermon. Um, I want to do um, perhaps three things this morning as I share. Uh, number one, I want to encourage all of you in your, in your journey of faith. Um, in today's world, I think we need as much encouragement as we can get. Uh, we live in a social climate that, well, it's like, it's like having, you know, one of those weeks or more than a week where it just rains and rains and rains, and you wonder, will you ever see the sunshine again? And sometimes I think that what happens to us as we follow Jesus in a social climate which doesn't seem to be encouraging to us in our faith. And um, whether it's been raining or cold or super hot and humid, we, we wonder, will it always be this way? And uh, I think some of the things I'll say to more, this morning will help us uh, maybe look at that differently. I want to also this morning, with the same things that I say, I want to give some words of reminder and encouragement to Kellen, who in, uh, in many ways is a favorite son to us. Uh, not that we don't love our other sons as much, but... Um, He's special among us. He's had a place among us as a, as a young man. He's, he's coming uh, into uh, and stepping into adulthood now with uh, a lot of plans ahead of him. And I want to say some things to you, Kellen, as well as everyone else here. And if you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus, I hope to give you a, a, a peek into the world of Christ's followers. And I want to do all that uh, by, by looking at some words that uh, King David in the Old Testament wrote. And I'm going to uh, read to you uh, some, a portion, not the whole psalm, but a, a portion of Psalm 145. So let's, let's look at this together and hopefully I can share some things that will uh, encourage you, encourage Kellen, and uh, help us all. So the psalmist starts in verse 145, uh, chapter 145, verse 1. I will exalt you, my God, the King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation will praise your works to another and will declare your mighty acts. I'm going to jump down to verse 8. He goes on to say, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His mercies are over all His works. All your works will give you praise 
and give thanks, all your works will give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly ones will bless you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your might to make known to the sons of mankind your mighty acts and the glory of your majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for King David. We thank you for your work in his life and the way you inspired him to write these verses, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that his words would be our words, Lord. His words would reflect our lives, Lord, or our lives would reflect his words. And that these words would come natural and common to us, Lord, that we would say them regularly, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would be able to understand uh, all that you have for us, God, and, and uh, as I've said recently, that we would be able to persevere in our faith and walk strong uh, and honor your name with our lives. We sang that this morning, Lord, that may all our days bring glory to your name, Lord. So help me this morning, help us this morning, Lord, see the power in your word, to see the revelation in your word for our lives and the lives of all who we would speak to. In Jesus' name, amen. David was quite a man. Uh, sometimes we, you know, we read about David, we read the things he, he wrote, and, and he's larger than life. Or, you know, we don't think of him as just one of the guys. But he was in many ways one of the guys, and he was a special person. He went from being a shepherd boy to a warrior. He went from being an outlaw to being a king. He experienced victory, defeat, and betrayals. He misused his authority to commit crimes. And he showed us what true repentance looks like. He was a pretty good singer-songwriter in today's terminology. And here's a man that God called, told the prophet, this one is a man after my own heart. And then we look at his life and see the, the foolish things he did, the wrong things he did. There's something in him that God wants us to see. God knew, because he knows all, God knew the end from the beginning. God knew that he would stumble, fall, do things that, we would never let David back in the pulpit after those things, right? We wouldn't restore. We'd say, okay, you're forgiven, but we'd be reluctant, wouldn't we? Yeah. His deeds and experiences are lessons to us all. His writings unfold insight into God's character. They contain prophetic revelations, and they have been sung and inspired how many songs? I mean, how many songs have we sung? I can think of at least two different songs that are taken just from those verses that I read. My title today is simple, The Big Picture, you know. David in this psalm gives us the big picture. And I think in today's world, we need the big picture. We need to be able to step back from the noise, step back from the things that want to just grab our minds and grab our hearts and see the big picture in life. Now, we've just spent 20 minutes or so singing of the glory of God, reminding ourselves and one another that God is good, faithful, that he is there for us. He, he, he's the one who cares for our wounded hearts. He's the one who died and bled and suffered for us that we could have communion with God. We, we sang all of the right things this morning. We sang good things this morning. And if you're like me, by the end of that 20 minutes or so, you're focused on what's clear. It's clear. God's the one. He's the one we need. This is where our lives should be directed from. But in about two hours, you're going to be back out there. You know, if you turn on your television, woo depending on the channel you turn on, you know. We need to know how to step back from the noise. We need to live a life that always steps back from the noise, from the storms in your life. 
You get into a storm, and that's all you can see is the storm. You get into, you get filled with worry, and that's all you can see with the worries. Somebody can quote to you that Jesus said, cast your cares upon him. But when you're in those worries, they want to eat you up. You need the big picture. You need to be able to see life with the big picture. You need to be reminded of the big picture all the time. And that's what David does in this psalm. He gives us, he gives us a, a, a picture of something away from the noise, away from the storms, away from the worries, away from the fears of our lives. And again, if you know his life, he experienced all of those things. He had highs and lows. He's doing real well, and then he goes off here, and he comes back, and, his, and all their whole camp was carried away. And even his own guys started grumbling against him, guys who'd been as loyal as could be. You know? But David got the big picture. So I wanted you to consider with me this morning three truths that we can find. I'm sure there's more, but three truths that I want to focus on from those verses I read, and a couple others we'll look to too. The first is that when you, get a, a, when you see the big picture, you can get the right perspective on life. We need the right perspective. Um, I'm not too much of a news junkie. My wife is. But I'm not too much of a news junkie. And so I'll come in the kitchen. She'll be, she'll be uh, cooking and doing stuff in the kitchen as I come in the house. And she's got, she's got some of the talking heads on that she listens to. And they, they all are telling you, how, they're telling you what's happening. But, you know, they only see it from their perspective. They only see it from one perspective. And I, I have to give her a lot of credit. She'll flip the channel to the other side of the aisle and listen to how they talk about the thing and try at least to get a good perspective. But you and I need the right perspective, not a good perspective. We need the right perspective. And David says it here. He says it so clearly, and this is the right perspective for every person that's ever lived to have. Great is the Lord. His greatness is unsearchable. Yeah. God is great. How many times have you heard people say God is great or God is good? We say God is great all the time. That is the right perspective to live life with. God is great. Yeah. Are you a sports fan? Is your team great? You like to think they are until they stumble and fall, right? You know, but when they win, they're the best. A number of years ago, my brother and I were watching the Super Bowl, and it was an enjoyable Super Bowl because our team wasn't in it, so we could just relax and watch it. And we invited somebody who had moved to the area from New England because the Patriots were in the game, and none of his family liked football. So he came over and watched it. And we, we, we delighted as, as the Atlanta Falcons took a 28 to nothing lead. He was so quiet. And if he watches this, Ryan, you know I'm talking about you. But he was so quiet. And, and we enjoyed it. And then the second half started, and the, the tide turned, and the Patriots fought all the way back and won the game at the end. He, he was insufferable when that happened. He was, it was just Jimmy and I and he in our big den, which is a good size room. He was dancing around, telling us how great Tom Brady was, you know. And it's because he saw this guy lead his team from, from that, you know, big deficit, this great comeback to win the game. And, you know, that's it. He goes, he's the greatest of all time. He's this and that. Yeah, 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 yeah. We beat you twice. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, is we talk about greatness, but we don't get it. We don't get it. We live in a society that throws the word awesome around you know, oh, this is awesome, that's awesome. Hey, I saw those new shoes you got. Awesome, baby. You know, awesome car, awesome. This, awesome. awesome means something that strikes awe in you. 
And when, this, when David says God is great, that he, great is the Lord, he doesn't mean he's just, oh, he won that game. He, he means this was what defines greatness. Great is the Lord. In fact, to help us a little bit, he says his greatness is unsearchable. That doesn't mean you can't search and look at his greatness. You will never find the end of it is what it's saying. It's unfathomable. You know, as we sang that this morning, that his, his mercy is so deep, you never come to the bottom of it. You never get to the end of it. God's greatness is, is it's unsearchable. You think God is great? Wait, there's more. And wait, there's more. You get to the edge of his greatness, it goes beyond. In fact, the word means beyond. It means beyond. So wherever you get, you say God is great. It goes beyond that. It's unsearchable. You'll never come to the end of his greatness. And if you don't look at life and look at this world you look, live in and say, you know how I need to look at this? First, I need to realize God is great. And his greatness is unsearchable. This is what I need to plug into for my life. He, he helps us see this. Whenever you found it, it goes beyond. It's the right perspective to have on life. But that's not all. He then goes to unpack some of God's greatness. He says this about God's greatness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Now you think, well, I can be kind of gracious. I've been compassionate. Not like God. Not like God. You know. We all, you know, Jesus said it this way. He says, he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's greatness. That's the kind of compassion and mercy in your heart that God talks about. That's God's greatness. It's to those who don't deserve it. You know, it's easy, or most of the time, it's easy to be gracious to people and compassionate with people that you get along with or you have some kind of affinity for. But this is God is, God is gracious to all. He's compassionate on all. He, said, he goes on to say that he's slow to anger and great in mercy. You know, it reminds us of God's perfect justice. You know, later on, he'll say, the Lord watches over those who love him, but he will destroy all the wicked. Justice will be done. And because God cannot stand wickedness or evil, that's how great his mercy is. Because he's merciful to those who don't deserve it. He is merciful to me. Less than a year before I, my eyes were open to Jesus, I was, I was cursing God with the worst curses you could use. And I just thought it was cool because I thought religion was stupid. And yet, he was merciful to me. That, you know, if somebody said something like that about, about me and I found out about it, I'd be slow to, oh, well, yeah, come on over, be my buddy. Come and sup with me. I, you know, I'd be slow, wouldn't you? But he knew all of the thoughts and the words and the deeds that I had done, just like you. And he was, he was slow to anger and great in mercy towards me. His justice will be done, but he's not quick with it because he desires to see every person be reconciled to him. That's how great he is. Finally, to unpack his greatness, it says this in, in, verses, uh, in verse 9. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are all over, are over all his works. You know? his, his goodness, when we think of God's goodness, we oftentimes think of, you know, what he does for us, uh, and that sort of thing. But it goes beyond what he does, which, of course, shows his goodness. Good, when we speak of God's goodness, we speak of his heart towards us, his kindness towards us, his posture towards us. He is predisposed to be kind to his creatures. Yeah. God is great. And that is the right perspective that we must go through life in. Because other things don't look so good sometimes. But we have to have that right perspective. And then we need to also see his greatness 
is, is in his working out his rule on the earth. It says here, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. One of the things that makes God great is he's not swayed or knocked off of who he is because of what we do. Yeah. We were having a, a, a meeting one day. I think it was, we were talking with a couple of people. It was after a service back when we met at 410 Broadway. And someone was asking me something, and it just got under my skin. And I kind of snapped at them. And later I got scolded by you-know-who that that was a really bad response. And of course, I defended myself by saying, what, isn't the pastor ever allowed to have a bad, bad response? No. And she said, no. No, you're, never, you're not allowed to. Not ever allowed to have it. You're not allowed to have bad days. God is unchangeable. And not only is he king over all, David calls him the king, speaking about king, of, uh, king over all other gods, but he, he is on top of everything. Uh, let, me put it th let me put it this way. He has a kingdom. By kingdom, I don't mean a physical place. I mean, he is, he is in charge. He is in charge of the universe. You know, we use the phrase, God is in control. And sometimes I think that's not the best word to use because we think, oh, God's controlling. But God's not controlling. He's in charge. Sometimes I used to let my kids run around and run amok, as they say. But it didn't stop me from being in charge. I just decided I'd give them a little leeway before I, you know, <laughs> brought judgment upon them. You know. <laughs> you know. God has never lost his grip on the affairs of mankind. And he offers his rulership in the lives of any person who will accept it. God is king over all the earth. When we see he's great, we're saying he is indeed the greatest. His greatness is unsearchable, and he is ruler over all. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. It was before, and it's now, and it's forever. And it goes from generation to generation. I remember when I first learned about the kingdom of God, I thought, oh, we discovered something. No, we didn't discover this. It had been written before. Ray gave me a book about this thick that was in like, he kept switching languages, this guy. And I was like, wait a minute, I got to get another dictionary there. And he'd been talking about the kingdom for years, explaining the kingdom of heaven as Jesus preached on it. And I read a book about 15 years ago, and this guy is talking like he'd, he'd discovered that the kingdom of heaven. I'm like, yeah, we, did. we discovered it, and they discovered it, and they discovered it, you know, going back. You know? He has never lost grip on the affairs of mankind. He has been king over all and will be king over all. This is the right perspective for you and I to have. Yeah. Psalm 2, David said it this way, Why are the nations restless and the peoples plotting in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let's tear their shackles apart, throw their ropes away from us. He who sits in the heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. God has installed his king. Jesus is king over all. And this is the right perspective for you and I to have. When you turn on the news this afternoon, I don't care what they say. Jesus is king. Uh, you know, when you look at the trends of our society, and, and they're not good right now in my opinion, Jesus is still king. He's king now. He was king during the 60s when we, were, we thought we were turning the world upside down. He was king during the Cold War. He's king now, and he will be king there. Kellen, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, he's still king overall. You got to hold on to that perspective because as you go off to college and you go into the military as your plans are, you're going to see things and say, where's, where's the king? He's still king. Yeah. This is the right perspective we have to have. We have to have 
holds on to it. David saw his kingdom as everlasting, and he rephrases it and repeats it and says, it's from generation to generation. You know, we look at the next generation, he says, and we say, Lord, you got to get through to them. Like our parents were praying, Lord, you got to get through to them. And their parents were praying, Lord, you got to get through to them. Generation to generation. Everybody thinks they know better than God. But the right perspective is that God is great and overall, and he has installed his king on Zion. And that, that brings us to a different place. So we need to have the right, right perspective. We also then, when, if we have the right perspective, we need to have the right response. If you see who God is, even just a little bit, it causes you to respond. That's why Peter said in the boat when Jesus brought up the catch, they'd been fishing all night, didn't catch anything. He said, well, let off your net over on this side. He said, okay, Lord. And, you know, they filled it up. They had to call the other boat. The boat started to sink. They had so many fish. Peter fell to his knees and said, depart from me. I'm a sinner. Yeah. He, he, he realized this man is like no other. This man is like no other. And he, he humbled himself and he worshiped. You know? The right response is worship. I will exalt you, Lord, my God and my King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I'll praise your name forever and ever. When we have the right perspective, it leads us to the right response. We need to worship the Lord. We need to worship the Lord in everything we say and do. We need to go, uh, we need to take the time to worship, to pray, to call upon his name. We need to meditate upon his goodness and his, and his person and allow our hearts and our spirit to, to commune with him and praise together with him. Yeah. What happens is we find ourselves in harmony to him. I don't know if it happened for you this morning. We're singing songs. There's one song, I, I, I can't remember which one it was, but it just, it rung so true in my heart about what I know about God that I got goosebumps on my arms. I just remembered that's so true about you, Lord. And there should be that kind of refreshing when we look upon him with the right perspective, look upon this life with the right perspective and then respond in worship, it should bring a joy to our hearts and a peace to our hearts, knowing that whatever it looks like, he's got it. He's got it. And our praise should go further than just singing and prayer. It, sh it should go to us passing it on. He, he said it this way again in the psalm. One generation will praise your works to another and will declare your mighty acts. And it goes on to say, they will speak of the glory of your kingdom, talk of your might to make known the sons, to the sons of mankind your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your king. You realize that sharing your faith, sharing your faith is the right response to seeing life the way it really is, seeing God as it really is. We declare with our words and confirm with our deeds. You know, many of us as parents look back and say, I'd wish I'd done that or I'd wish I'd done this, wish I'd said that. It's just normal for a parent to want to have changed some things they did and have done some things differently. But many of us can also say, our children saw us live what we preached. My kids were no stranger to understanding forgiveness because when we handled things wrong, we asked for their forgiveness. And they understand those kind of things. We declare his excellencies in the way we live along with our words. So we need to have this right perspective. Let's see if I get that. If we have the right perspective, if that is, if we see life clearly and correctly, and if we have the right response and that we live our lives always giving God his due, I think then we will go through life with the right expectation. And I guess I'm starting to lean toward you now, Kellen, in my sermon. Because 
You've got so much ahead of you. And what you expect in life will help you get through it. Most of my heartaches are unfulfilled expectations. And most of my expectations that caused me heartache were unrealistic expectations. You know, by the time I was 30 and, you know, had kids in the, in the mix and now I was, you know, really knew Jesus. I knew all the lingo by then, you know. And, you know, and then when things didn't go my way, I'm like, why, Jesus, why? Because I wasn't seeing clearly. I didn't see that life is filled with this. If I had read the scripture better, I'd see that all the great men, all the men and women that followed God had heartache and trouble. It doesn't exempt us from that. But he's on the throne. He's still in charge. In fact, when we lose sight of God's character and rulership, we stop expecting his hand to move in our lives and in our world. David said it this way near the end of this psalm. He said, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, kind in all his works, the Lord is near to all who call on him and to all and and to all who call on him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry for help and save them. How's that for a mouthful of promises, huh? Yeah. The writer of the Hebrews reminds us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And these are the kind of verses that you need to have in your heart, Kellen. Remember that the Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. And you are one of his works. All of you are his works. He's kind to you. Lord is near to all who call on him. All you have to do is call upon him and he's there. If you call upon him in truth from a sincere heart, he will be there. And he will sort out your desires, and he will hear your cry for help, and he will save you. Obviously, there's the one meaning of saving you and redeeming you to himself, but there's also the meaning of carrying you through your troubles. Many of us, Kellen, that speak to you, well, you know, we're at least one, if not two, generations ahead of you. But we, I see that you have de begun to develop this perspective. You have sought to know and understand the, the ways of God. And you have worked to articulate his truth to others. And I commend you for that. You have proven to be a servant among us, even beyond being voluntold by your parents. You volunteer on your own. You're respectful and you're honorable among us. And you're a pretty good drummer, too. We celebrate your life and celebrate this chapter of your life that's about to, the page is about to turn on. And I want you, like I want all of us, to remember these truths. The right perspective, the right response, and the right expectations. God will carry you through. He will be there for you. You have so much ahead of you but he will be there for you every step of the way. I think every one of us can say amen to that. Amen. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask uh, Les, uh, Tony's not here today. Ray, would you come and join us? And Kellen, come on up. We're going to pray for you. And then we'll have some food. Okay. Oh, he's got to finish everything off with food. That's right. One of your mentors here. You want to stand and pray with us? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, we, Lord. We, we just thank you so much for Kellen. Thank you for his life and the heart you've put into him, Lord, the heart that you're, you're working into him, Lord, the things that you're doing in him now and the things that you will do in the future, Lord. Lord, we pray that your hand would be upon him in a great way, Lord, 
that your hand would be upon him to guide him, to uh, uh, illuminate his mind and heart to your truth, Lord, and that your spirit would fill him in such a way to make him strong for this day and age that he walks into, Lord. Lord, as older people, we look at the world we live in and see the challenges, and you know, Lord, we sometimes get overwhelmed, and this is the world that Kellen is walking into, Lord, that we'll become an adult, a full adult, and a man, and have a family, and all that you have for him in, Lord. So he needs your wisdom and guidance and strength as he walks toward his future, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would just impart to him all that he needs, Lord. And let us continue to pray for him and stand with him and strengthen him, even from afar, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You guys got anything to say? Kellen, I want you to remember, says the Lord, that it's often hard to hear the voice of the Lord to a busy person. So make sure that you set aside simple and quiet times to listen, mm -hmm. to hear, because the Lord's voice is often too quiet to hear in the midst of trouble and turmoil. It's, it's too quiet to hear in the midst of busy plans and, and such. So the Lord says and wants to remind you to make your heart quiet before him mm -hmm. each day. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, I, I confirm that, Kellen. The Lord was saying to me that you should start each day looking for God's voice to be the first voice mm -hmm. you hear. That you set apart the early part of the day to do your devotions, to look to Him, read His Word, lay your heart before Him every day. And let God guide you that day. Let Him lead you in all the things that are before you. Let Him fill you every day with His Spirit that you might have a fresh sense of God's presence with you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. And as the psalm says, the Lord is near to all who call on him, who call on him in truth. He'll be near to you every day. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you.